Here, free of the constraint placed on him by the White House, is an authentic contemporary American hero, General John Singlaub. Nearly two decades ago, President Kennedy entered the White House admonishing the American people to ask what we could do for our country. During the third of a century that I've served my country in uniform, I've asked myself that question every day. And only recently it became clear that the only way I could satisfy that patriotic responsibility was to shed my uniform in order to free my ability to speak out. For years I've anguished, as have most of my fellow officers and most of you, as the United States of America retreated from the front ranks of free world leadership. Korea was a heartbreaking stalemate because we refused to make it our policy to win. The loss of Cuba to communism was a defeat in our hemisphere because we turned the Monroe Doctrine into a meaningless piece of paper. Vietnam was a defeat, not a military defeat. We won, in fact, all the major battles. It was a defeat because, repeating our Korean blunder, we refused to win. The American Canal, which this administration would abandon to Panama, is our first retreat from United States soil because we buckled under the psychological warfare of our own State Department and the pressure from the New York bankers who wanted the American taxpayers to bail them out of their bad loans to the Panamanian dictator. I am, above all things, a realist. The wars cannot be refought. What is gone unhappily may be gone forever. But as a realist, I also know that retreat from reality can stop the very moment the leader sounds the call to the people, the moment the leader says, beyond this line, we will not be pushed. While presidents and senators, arms negotiators, political scientists and State Department diplomats worry about words like coexistence, detente, military parity, and sufficiency, the American people, myself included, worry instead about two simple words, survival and freedom. How ironic it is that while we Americans have so much difficulty understanding our leaders, we have no difficulty understanding our enemies. Recently, during a four-hour meeting in Moscow, a prominent American congressman was told by the Soviet First Deputy of Defense, the Marshal of the Soviet Union, N.V. Ogarkov, today the Soviet Union has military superiority over the United States, and henceforth the United States will be threatened. You had better get used to it. Now, you can be sure the Soviet Marshal was sober when he made that threat, because his words at this very moment are matched by communist deed. For example, Billions of dollars worth of Soviet and East European weaponry are pouring into Africa. Thousands of soldiers from Cuba and hundreds of Russian advisors are propping up their fellow Marxists and killing more Africans than all the Western colonial struggles combined and multiplied by 10. And what is our response? Aside from allowing its UN ambassador to call the Cuba mercenaries a stabilizing influence, the current administration has occasionally sputtered a mild protest. Meanwhile, the administration plunges ahead with its own policy to destabilize the internal Rhodesia peace between blacks and whites, with the result that the Marxists would take control. What I am saying, as hard as it is to believe, is that in Africa, we have sided with the communists on the question of Rhodesia. Despite the fact that Rhodesia's white government has effectively turned over to the black moderates majority rule over their country. As for South Africa, a double standard has come into play. Our own country is still in the process of racially desegregating, but our administration demands that immediate full voting rights be given the black majority, while South Africa's system of racial discrimination is abhorrent to me and most people of goodwill, two facts must be brought to the administration's attention. First, the human rights record of most independent black African states is even sorrier than South Africa's with Idi Amin of Uganda just one of many such tyrants. Second, instant universal suffrage would drive white South Africans from the land they've ruled for three centuries, creating chaos and collapse of an industrialized economy. This would compound black suffering while turning over to the communists one of the richest sources of minerals and natural wealth in the world, sources which are of life or death importance to the American economy and defense. The balance of power between the communist world and the free world is not shifting. It has shifted, not in an irretrievable sense, but on so clearly projected a scale that unless the United States takes immediate and dramatic steps to reverse the trend, our present inferior military and strategic condition will become permanent. And as we have been so candidly told by the Soviets, we had better get used to being threatened. For me, the threats are not new. For my children and grandchildren and for yours, I pray we will be strong enough
to face those threats to our very life and freedom in the years, months, and days ahead. Thank you, General Singlaub, not only for your candor and your professional assessment of America in retreat, but thank you for showing the ultimate courage of retiring from the service in order to take the truth to the American people. You know